Good morning, Portland. It is the single greatest threat that mankind has ever faced. But we can't raise an army to fight this. There's no combination of superheroes and superpowers that can fix this for us. Not even James Bond is available. <laughs> I am talking about the very real and ever-growing threat of climate change. Now, we hear a lot about the impact of climate change. We hear about severe weather, we hear about droughts, we hear about threats to agriculture, vast migration from uninhabitable areas, loss of plant life, loss of the coral reefs, loss of animal species. But we don't hear so much about solutions. So why is that? Is it because there are no solutions? Well, I'm here to tell you today that there are solutions. We can fix this. So, a little bit about climate change first. What is the main driver of climate change? It's the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Unlike other synthetic gases, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a long, long period of time. As we burn fossil fuels, as we build buildings, as we do the agriculture, we need to feed our people. We send more and more carbon dioxide on a one-way journey into the atmosphere. It heats up the planet, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. Now, nobody here should take my word for this. Just last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a huge report. Two conclusions you really need to know. We have 12 years to make drastic and unprecedented changes to limit the worst impacts of climate change. 12 years. Second conclusion, even if we stop emitting tomorrow, instantly, there is too much CO2 in the atmosphere already. It will continue to heat the planet up. Things will continue to get worse. Of course, there are some who still doubt this, but when two and a half thousand climate scientists all speak with one voice, do we need a second opinion? I don't think so. <laughs> but 12 years is plenty of time, right? What's the problem with 12 years? Well, just next people can solve that. So to think about 12 years, we should think about something that happened 12 years ago, so we give ourselves a frame of reference. So what happened in 2007? In 2007, this guy got to the stage, and he introduced the iPhone. What an awesome thing. 12 years ago, it seems like yesterday, right? 12 years to make drastic and unprecedented changes. But the iPhone also gives us a lot of hope. Think about this. Today, a third of the planet has an iPhone. We've built an infrastructure worldwide, so wherever you are, you can get access to Wi-Fi. It's changed the way we think, the way we learn, the way we play, the way we watch rock concerts, <laughs> the way we find love. So the iPhone gives us hope here. If we can make that type of unprecedented and urgent change in 12 years, surely we can do the same for climate change. Now, I'm a really simple guy. I like to think of things simply. So I'm going to give you a very simple analogy that helped me understand how to solve this problem. So we've all bathed our kids in the bath. We know that there is a certain amount of water in the bath that is safe. I want you to think of the bathtub as the atmosphere and the water as CO2. We're emitting more and more and more. And oh, oh, we just wrecked the house. <laughs> when the water overflows the bathtub, the house gets wrecked. So, really simple guy, really simple solutions. What do you do about that? Well, the first and most obvious thing to do is what a lot of people are already working to do. You turn down the tap. You reduce the amount of emissions that you make, and that's a lot better. There we go. But guess what? What's going to happen to your bath? It's still going to overflow. If you cannot turn that top off completely, it's just a matter of time. So, what would you do in your house? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You would pull out the plug. If you pull out the plug, if you remove the CO2 in the atmosphere already, your tap can still be dripping. You may not be able to solve all emissions, but the level of CO2 in the atmosphere will drop. And that's the solution. So, do we have a plug? So, the company that I have the privilege of leading, this is their facility in Squamish, British Columbia, about 350 miles north from here. It's been running since 2015, capturing carbon dioxide directly 
from the atmosphere. You can see that Squamish is a beautiful place. What you don't see here is the carbon dioxide in the air that is killing the planet. And the carbon dioxide in Squamish is the same as the carbon dioxide in Portland, in Delhi, in Tokyo, in Africa. It's uniformly spread through the world. These plants, this small plant is a start for our company and for solving this problem, but we're going to build much larger plants. One of these plants, a larger plant, will do the work of 40 million trees. 40 million trees. So think how long it will take to plant 40 million trees. And let me give you another little number. If we want to completely eliminate emissions, 40,000 plants times 40 million trees. It's a heck of a lot of trees. We have to have a technological solution as well as use things like trees. So if we can capture the CO2 from the atmosphere, what should we do with it? Well, the first thing you can do with it, if you combine the CO2 from the atmosphere and hydrogen from renewable energy, you can make this fuel. And no, David, don't worry, it doesn't explode. <laughs> it's, it's just fine. So have a think about that. <laughs> Have a think about what this uh, fuel is doing. You're taking CO2 from the atmosphere and you're making a fuel. This fuel will go in anybody's car sat in this room. And when you put this fuel in your car and you drive it, it's carbon neutral. So let me take an example. This gentleman here, perhaps maybe he flew to Hawaii last year. His plane emitted a lot of CO2 in the process. We captured it, we made this fuel. This lady here in the front, perhaps, She's taking the kids to school or going to work. She puts this fuel in her car. She drives CO2 into the atmosphere. We capture it again. And then we put it in that gentleman's car, then this lady's truck, any ship, any plane. By doing so, you create a cycle and you recycle the CO2 continuously. So that's just one use, this fuel. But even better, this fuel is completely clean burning. So behind me on the left, that's regular diesel. And we're all familiar with that problem of driving behind a truck, black smoke. Our fuel is completely clean burning, no sulfur, no carcinogenics. So we can make fuel. If we make fuel, we're turning off one of those taps, transportation tap. The transportation tap is very hard. There's a billion cars in the world. Those of you who have electric cars, fantastic. You're doing your work in turning off taps. But there's a billion cars in the world times $30,000 a car, that's $30 trillion before everybody in the world has an electric car. So here's a way that we can help turn off the tap of transmission, transportation emissions earlier than that. But we still want to remove the plug from the bathtub. Remember the bathtub. So that's the second thing. If you capture CO2 from the atmosphere and you bury it back underground, you put it back where it came from in the first place. You are continuously removing the water from the bathtub, the CO2 from the atmosphere. There's enough room in the United States alone for over 500 years worth of emissions to be buried back underground. This can be done. So now we know that we have the technology, we know how it can solve the problem. So now we should talk about an example. So how can we bring this type of technology to the market? Well, I want, to talk, I want to give you an example again, because I'm a simple guy. In the mid-19th century, cities across North America and the rest of the world were rife with cholera, typhoid, other diseases like that. And then a guy called John Snow, not that John Snow. <laughs> a guy called John Snow figured out the link between contaminated water and the spread of disease. So guess what happened? He said we should treat the water. We should have a water treatment infrastructure to stop this problem. Now, of course, people doubted the science. They doubted the cost. They said it can't be done. In fact, they said to him, you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't resist that. But 94 years later, 94 years later, the federal government instigated water treatment as an infrastructure and a federal government responsibility. When did you last hear anybody complaining about the budget for water treatment infrastructure? Today, fast forward to 2019, the air is killing the planet. 
We know that to be true. The science shows it. There are some who say, no, it doesn't. We know we can fix it. We have the technologies. Well, today, it's our air that needs treatment. We need an air treatment infrastructure, the same way we have a water treatment infrastructure, the same way we have a solid waste infrastructure. So you're thinking, ah, too expensive, we can't afford this. Well, can we afford not to do this? It's estimated by uh, experts that the cost just in the United States alone, in terms of agriculture and lost jobs and all those things, over $500 billion per year if we don't do something about this. So what is the cost? Well, again, there are people who've done these estimates. So to mitigate climate change, we need to switch to renewable energy. We need to move ourselves away from fossil fuels. We need to all watch the emissions in what we do. But we also need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So how much would it cost to do all of that and mitigate the worst impacts? 1%. 1%. So let me give you an example of 1%. We spend more per year on alcohol than this. We spend more per year on advertising than this. Now, it is about twice the coffee budget, but I'm sure you'd all agree that's fair enough. <laughs> but also, and this one really worries me, we spend more on one day, three times as much on one day than this, Christmas Day. So we're all happy to spend three times this to have one nice day. Why don't we spend a third of that to make our kids' future days just fine too? <laughs> what is the world that you want your kids to grow up in? I have kids. I hope they're watching today. I don't know. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Hannah. If they're watching, wonderful because I want them to grow up in the same world that I had the privilege to grow up in. Not a world in which we have all those problems, migration, floods, all those things, but hey, we're 1% richer, woohoo. I know which world I want for my kids. So when you leave here today, I ask you to remember one or two things. Number one, there's no greater challenge than this. There really isn't. And surely this should be our top priority. Number two, we need to remove, remove emissions, reduce emissions, I'm sorry, but we also need to remove the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. Number three, the technology exists. We can do this. So please walk out of here, remember, we can fix this. Thank you.